Malachi, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we're going to be talking about summertime. It's now the third week of June. Summer just passed a few days ago. And there's three things you must do now if you have not done so already. And I think summertime is the ideal time to be practicing these three things that we're going to discuss in this video. I'm bringing into it research that's brought in by Cornell University, as well as the University of California, as well as guest speakers, Lisa Smith, who's a licensed arborist here in Los Angeles, as well as Tom's, as well as Tom Spellman of the Dave Wilson Nursery. And Dave Wilson Nursery is one of the um, highest ranked, largest distributor of fruit trees in the United States. So um, we're gonna hear a little bit about what he has to say about tree care and management and some great practices to implement into your gardens right now being summertime. The first one is fertilization and the plant's metabolism is peaking in the summertime. So if you have not fed your trees yet this year, this is an excellent time to be doing so. And if there's only going to be one time of the year to do it, this is it. Um, if we take a look at this graph over here that I prepared, it talks about the metabolism of your plant on this side and winter, spring, summer, and fall. And then back to winter. And if we take a look at the chart, the metabolism of the plant is pretty slow in the winter, building up towards the spring, peaking in the summer, coming back down in the fall, and then back and then by winter the metabolism you know many plants go into dormancy and even the evergreens their metabolism is a lot slower come winter than it is otherwise spring summer and fall so i wrote over here in the winters months aside from maybe a foliar feed on your citrus you know as well as other you know evergreen trees i don't necessarily feed my plants at all it's really in the spring summer and fall that your plants are going to benefit the most from feeding it and more so in the summer than any other time of the year. So let's talk about fertilizer. So as you may have heard me say over and over and over again in all the dozens of videos that were published by Ivory Organics, the importance of using an organic fertilizer over a chemical fertilizer, but I'm gonna be sharing some additional insight on that right here, right now. Um, so be patient and listen through this real quickly. In regards to the organics, which I have up here on the steps, um, take a look at the ingredients that come in your organic formulations. If you take a look at the back of, for example, this here is made by Espoma. If we turn it over, we're going to take a look at where it's derived from. And over here it says derived from feathers and poultry manure and bone meal, alfalfa meal, um, sulfate of potash, and magnesia. So that's organic sources over here derived from feathers bones, poultry manure, sulfate of potash. We take a look at another one. We're gonna look at derived from soybean meal, feather meal, dicalcium phosphate, blood meal, corn meal, potassium chloride. And the other thing to look at are the numbers on the product. This is an 888, a nice balanced fertilizer with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in equal numbers. This one over here, also balanced, 444. That means 4% of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And then we've got this product over here, which is a 526. So it's putting less emphasis on the phosphorus, which is the middle number, um, but higher in nitrogen and higher in um, potassium for healthier um, root development and disease resistance. So these are three formulations, but I brought with me also this product, which says triple 15. And you can see 15, 15, 15. But this here is derived from, let's read the source of the ingredients over here. And it says plant food derived from monoammonium phosphate, ammonium sulfate, murate of potash, urea, and gypsum. These are all, aside from the gypsum, these are all chemical sources for creating the 15% nitrogen, 15% phosphate, and 15% potash. And then there's the added sulfur um, with the ammonium sulfate that's added to this product as well. But take a look at what the difference is between this, which is chemically derived. Let's get some light on it so you can see it. So this is chemical versus, let's take a look at something that's derived from feather and bone meal and what that looks like. Take a look here. Let's get that in the light. 
You can see this is made out of blood meal and bone meal and feather meal and all of those are all you know, granulated together. This is an organic source. The smell also is totally different. The chemical source smells like a chemical. The organic source smells like dead and rotten animal sometimes. Um, so, what's the difference? When it comes to fertilizing your plants organically, what you're doing is you're feeding the soil biology. Your chemical fertilizers are only adding the elements to the soil, but it's not feeding the soil biology. So you're doing nothing in regards to improving the biodiversity of the soil microorganisms using a chemical fertilizer. So that's the importance and the reason that there's a huge swing towards using organic fertilizers in your garden. Another reason for not using chemical fertilizers, according to Castings for Growth, let me share this here with you. So Castings for Growth LLC, they're, um, I usually like sharing the website link, but you'll find it. Talks about the benefits of granular dry castings. But in here it says that studies have shown that only 25% of applied synthetic, which are your chemical fertilizers, are ever used by the plant. The rest of them are leached into the water table and makes makes it into you know your river streams and ultimately the ocean. So we're talking about only 25% is being used up by the plant. The other 75% is wasted. Whereas the organic fertilizers, again, are being tied in to the soil biology and and becoming part of the um, the food web that's happening within your soil benefiting the earthworms, the nematodes, the beneficial fungi, and, and the list continues. So now when feeding your plants, and this is a practice I've been using for decades, is making sure that you add some compost around the tree or your plants, this applies to your fruits and vegetables as well, as well as your ornamentals, roses, and so forth, is to add a couple of handfuls of compost. And this here is a product I picked up at the um, local garden center. This here is made by Kellogg's, but it can come from anywhere. And again, let's take a look at the ingredients where it's derived. If you take a look here, it says um, derived from, and it says, you know, dehydrated poultry manure, hydrolyzed feather meal, and ferrous sulfate. So they even added something to increase some micro elements into the soil as well. So what I like doing is just taking a handful or two of this compost and adding it around the base of the tree. And what this will do now is improve the condition of the soil and provide more nutrients to the ground while the soil biology is consuming the organic. So now we're gonna add our organic fertilizer around the base of the tree. You're gonna be sure to follow the directions on the package. And again, my recommended um, advice when it comes to doing this is to repeat this process come spring, summer, and fall with the summer being the most that you fertilize your plant. And again, being that you're doing this organically, your chances of burn are minimal. So here we go. What we're gonna do once we've applied the organics as well as the compost around the plant is we're just gonna rake that in using our, our garden tool into the top quarter inch of the soil. We're going to make sure that berm it continues to exist around the tree. And now we're just going to soak it. So watering can take anywhere from 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, even an hour. If I water at a lower rate, the goal is to ultimately soak the entire root ball. If I water this too quickly, I might end up only watering the top inch or two. It's very important to soak the entire root ball of the tree. And you can see that by creating a berm around the tree, I'm making sure that none of the water is lost or run off into the um, drain pipes or, or into this um, street water. So what we're doing is we're making sure that the water that's applied stays around the root zone. So again, on the topic of fertilization, and as you saw, when we fertilized the tree, we also added some compost around the base of the tree, and this can apply again to your tomatoes, your peppers, all of your vegetables, your roses, your ornamentals, all of your trees. Fertilize organically and add a couple hands of compost, and then the benefits of adding compost, I found this article from the University of Minnesota Extension, and let's read this together. 
It reads here, the use of compost as a soil amendment. And it reads, compost is used as an organic amendment to improve the physical, the chemical, and the biological properties of soils. Adding compost will increase the moisture holding cap capacity of sandy soils, thereby reducing drought damage to plants. When added to heavy clay soils, compost will improve drainage and aeration, thereby reducing water logging damage to plants. Compost increases the ability of the soil to hold and release essential nutrients and promotes the activity of earthworms and soil microorganisms beneficial to plant growth. Other benefits of adding compost include improved seed emergence and water infiltration due to reduction of soil crusting. And then I've also highlighted it usually necessary to supplement compost with some fertilizer, which we just did, particularly nitrogen. Um, and you can find this again right here under www.extension.umn.edu under the use of compost of, as a soil amendment. So have some of you heard about what's called black gold or worm castings or just worm manure? And worm manure is derived from obviously the worms leaving its waste behind in the soil, but the result of that action, that activity that's happening within your garden is priceless it's invaluable and the benefits are far too many to count but i'm going to try to you know express a few and i've even got to study by cornell university on the benefits of worm castings for your plants one that comes to mind is i know that with some people that are having difficulty with aphids attacking their plants they'll typically buy worm casting at a premium price and bringing that in your soil because it pretty much has like um you know, some type of antibiotic pest control benefits to your plants by adding that into your soil. But what better way than buying all of these expensive worm casting products and actually getting the worms into your garden? And how else are you possibly going to get those worms in your garden if you don't do things organically? And here's just an example, but a product made by Espoma, another one made by Job's, there's other products made by Kellogg's. And you've got all of these organic options and what they're doing is they're feeding those worms and those worms are creating the waste that are then benefiting the plants. Let's read about the University of Cornell and what they had to say about worm castings. So here's Cornell published on June 25th, 2017. It says worm compost can suppress plant disease, regulate nutrients. Um, vermicompost, which is the product of composting using various species of worm, is not only an excellent fertilizer, but could also help prevent a pathogen that has been um, scourged to greenhouse growers. And I also highlighted an organic way to raise healthier plants with less environmental impact. And down here it says important de disease suppressive soil amendments. And let's take just a second and view um, some of the worms that we found in our compost bin that was just behind me. Check this out. Compost, which you can get as an amend or a grow mulch from your nursery. And this here is one that I've purchase as you can see here so this here is um, a compost that we can add to the um, soil as well as over here is one that I've made in my own garden and if you take a look in here you see that this is alive check out all of these worms look at this and look at that that's just amazing but it's not completely broken down look at how alive that is this is just amazing isn't it Another important article that I um, brought to your attention earlier is again by Casting for Growth, LLC, and the benefits of worm castings here. It says it's safe and non-toxic, it's a sustainable solution for feeding your plants, it has beneficial nematodes in the waste, it has um, insect control benefits, fungus and disease control benefits, weed suppression, water retention, naturally aerates and softens soils, problems synthetic fertilizers are believed to have created such as nitrogen runoff or leaching into the water table. Studies have shown only 25% of the applied synthetic or those chemical fertilizers are ever used by the plant. And these organics cannot burn your lawns and plant. Check this out. Look at all of these free wood chips I picked up from the city of Los Angeles at Griffith Park. I'm gonna put that video link down below. You can also find it in the links towards the end of this video or up in the right hand corner. You can actually click on that and I'll show you a free source for getting all of these wood chips in the city of Los Angeles. But we're putting a nice two, three, four inch layer of wood chips 
all around our fruits and trees and even around our vegetables. As you can see, this here is the new stuff and it's all new, all behind me. But in front of you, right where you're standing, is last year's, at least a year and a half ago's layer of wood chips. And let's come in a little closer and see what's going on here. You can see today's about an 85 to 90, 95 degree day. You can see that the wood chips are still retaining moisture and it hasn't been wet here in at least the last two days. You can see how wet it is still back here. I just saw a worm, look at the worm. Look at all this life that's under here. I was not expecting this. I kind of did this just on the spur of the moment, but I expected that we're gonna see some stuff. And you can see that we're now working our way down to in Los Angeles, a lot of us have this hard clay soil. But you can see we've got quite a bit of life considering this is soil that's never been improved nor amended ever. But the worms, as they're working their way up to those, to that mulch layer and they're eating these fine, you know, particulates, they look pretty coarse now, but they're working their way down and within it, there's also some leaves and branches aside from parts of the tree trunk that are in here, which are all of the elements and macro and micronutrients that are in here breaking down feeding the soil, feeding the soil biology, not just the earthworms you saw, but also the nematodes, the beneficial fungi, as well as, as well as the beneficial bacteria. So we're putting a nice two to three inch layer and the importance of wood chips is immeasurable as well. A very important process and as Lisa Smith, who I'm gonna let you listen to right now, she says that this process in fact creates antibiotics that help protect your plants and make them healthier and longer living and longer lasting check this video out. Okay, good morning. Hi. Almost afternoon. Okay, it's 11 o'clock already. Charles, you are amazing. Thank you again for the introduction and for inviting me, and I love your group. We had so much fun. I think it was like a year and a half ago. You're welcome. To quickly refresh everybody's memory, yeah. um, Lisa Smith in the last three to four years is probably, not probably, she is our number one best guest speaker we've ever had. Um, she no, no. is licensed, certified, and has a true true passion in plant care and tree care um, and I know one of the topics we're going to talk about is tree safety which we talked about right before you came as well um, so we're truly honored and blessed to have Lisa Smith with us here today um, and hoping that she answers a lot of the questions um, that you may have in regards to your plant and tree care as well Lisa Smith yeah thank you Charles You're welcome. <laughs> so um, Yesterday, thank you. And so I want to thank the Parsikians also for having yeah. us here. This is for you. They do oh, thank you. She's so sweet. Ooh, we got the cold water. Here. And um, <laughs> so last time I spoke with you guys, okay, we were in the middle of a five-year drought. And I, all I talked about was the drought. It was how to maintain your tree, how to water your tree, what trees can tolerate the drought. And then lo and behold, we had the mother load of rain. And then we had wind. Has anybody experienced any wind this year? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Charles called me yesterday morning and he said, you know, we're going to do it outdoors. And I said, great. I don't have to rejigger my PowerPoint. I'm going to be free form. I'm going to be a free range chicken today. So <laughs> I'm just going to talk to you about managing your trees during extreme events. And what does that mean? It could be extreme drought. It could be extreme rain. Mm -hmm. It could be extreme wind. And these are three things I want to talk to you today. And Charles, I think I'm like a perfect segue because he talked a lot about soil. And soil is super important, as we all know. And the health of your soil can dictate the health of your canopy. So when you have extreme events, whether it's extreme rain or extreme wind or even extreme <laughs> drought, the soil health and vigor dictates the root health. And that root health dictates your canopy health. And everything starts with the roots. You know, I take my probiotic in the morning, and I'm trying to maintain good, good enzymes and all that. Well, roots need the same thing. So I'm going to talk about three things. The soil, um, ah, I had that in my mind. I want to talk about the soil, how you're going to water it, irrigation. I'm going to talk about mulch, my favorite topic. And we're going to talk about pruning for safety. So let's start with the mulch because I love mulch. And mulch, let me just tell you, I'm gonna be quick about this. Mulch is your friend. Mulch is the most important thing that you can do for your trees because mulch has so many benefits. Now you're wondering, okay, what bag do I buy? Where do I get it? But I'm gonna I'm gonna break the rules and I'm gonna tell you the best mulch to get is wood chips. And if you use a compost, that's fine. 
if you use a bark, that's fine, but you're not going to get the long-term benefits that you will from wood chips. And wood chips are actually in a in, in a in a uh, in a form that is going to most benefit your soil. The way wood mulch wood chips break down is that they activate enzymes and they really feed those enzymes. So as the wood mulch is breaking down, it's creating all the nutrients into the soil and those enzymes create antibiotics. Isn't that crazy? Wood mulch creates antibiotics. Now what would we want to be preventing? Anybody have any ideas what we want to prevent? Mold. Disease. disease. Mold, disease, disease, root rot, stressed roots. So it's nature's way of protecting the roots. We have leaf litter. When you're in the woodlands, you see a branch fall and it decomposes. <laughs> it's creating those antibiotics. You don't find Phytophthora root rot and Armillaria malia, oak root fungus, rampant in woodlands like you just have natural trees growing. Because it has that natural cycle, it's breaking down the leaves, it's breaking down the wood bark, the bark and the um, broken limbs, and it's breaking that down, it's creating a suppressant antibiotic. So we can do that in our urban environment. It's like, well, you know, I've got a big California pepper tree in my front yard. I have some smaller trees, some red buds and some other stuff. But I really dedicate the first, I have a 14 foot tree ring underneath my pepper tree. Because I know California pepper are susceptible to oak root fungus. Oak root fungus is our malaria. Mulch, when you place down about two to three inches of mulch, you're actually creating a good blanket of protection for your roots. So, any questions so far on that? Yes? Uh, is there a certain kind of mulch you don't want to get, like cedar mulch or? Well, I think I wouldn't get a colored mulch, and I wouldn't use a rubber mulch, and I wouldn't use a gravel mulch. I'm not a big fan of rocks and gravel underneath. Now, let me back up for a second here, and when you have, say this circle right here is the tree's root zone, and the tree's, here's its trunk, and here's its root zone. Now, I'm a compromiser, so I tell people, if you can dedicate at least six feet from the trunk out with just mulch, that's great. Once you do your DG or your gravel or something inorganic, that's not going to be a well, DG. I mean, once you do something that's less of a mulch, you should do it further away from the trunk. Imagine all of the roots in the first six feet are what we call the CRZ, the critical root zone. Very critical because that's kind of like the core of the tree. The tree can lose the roots out there and the roots out there, but once it starts to lose roots right close to the trunk, that's when you're going to start to see stress in the canopy. So you really want to protect that critical root zone. So if you're going to do a mulch and you're like, I mean, I, I work with hotels and shopping centers and they're like, I can do two feet. I'm like, fine, I'll take two feet. You know, I'm, what can I do? But if best world, best, we call it BMPs, best management practices, those say, do as much mulch as you can as far out. <coughs> now, go ahead. I was, uh, I'm glad you asked that though because I was just going to say, you guys all know this. I'm going to tell you something. I know you guys all know this. What should you not do with mulch? Right next to the tree. Right. Don't put the mulch right next to the tree. Now let me tell you why. Because it holds moisture. Remember the mulch is good, it's gonna hold the moisture. Well, you don't want it to create a mulch volcano touching the trunk. So you don't want, you want that trunk to have a nice, free, I mean mulch does not, I mean sometimes you get that in a woodland where mulch and leaf litter is falling next to the base of the tree. That's a natural environment. But the problem we have in our urban environments is we water more often. So also, if you have a juvenile tree, I see this all the time, people will plant a little tree, it's three, four, five inches in diameter. When they put that mulch very close, the little roots grow out into the mulch and they circle around. Now, 10 years down the road, that little root is now a big root and it's called a stem girdling root. Do you guys know about that, the stem girdling root? An SGR? You never heard of an SGR? <laughs> no, Stem girdling root? <laughs> okay. Let me tell you 
I could retire on lawsuits on stem girdling roots because, as you know, they cause trees to fall over. SGRs, imagine if you're like this, and we're going to talk about wind. Imagine you've got a stem girdling root from when you were a little baby tree. Where else do you get stem girdling roots? Pots. Pots. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. They're, al they're alert over here. <laughs> so imagine when you're buying a container and those roots are going round and round and round and you put it in the ground, what are they going to do? Are they going to go, oh, we can now grow outward. No, they just keep going in the same direction, round and round and round. And I'm going to tell you, you know, I, I've got so many stories I can tell you, but I'm going to tell you one because it's kind of interesting. It's a lawsuit. A woman was at, he was sitting in the food park and a Chinese elm tree just went and popped over and landed on her and hit her back. And she was injured pretty, pretty badly. So we come out there and literally the base of the, the trunk was like, imagine this is the tree in the ground. This is the tree in the ground. See that? It was just like that. The tree popped out, and that was the base of the trunk. It had been girdled back to its old 15-gallon container size. Wow. I measured it. I was on the plaintiff's side in this case, and I'm, I'm do both sides of all kinds of work. But this was textbook, stem girdling root, SGR, and how the industry practices from, from many years ago encourage this problem. And it's only a matter of time before it becomes like a twisted sausage underground. And so I have in my storage unit, not only about that much of the trunk and showing it literally like this, and in that trunk is a big indent where a root wrapped around the entire base. And I made them dig out the whole entire root ball, which is like a beautiful bowl where that root, where that trunk was previously emanating out of. So now that's an extreme case. But I want you to understand why stem girdling roots are a problem because they cut off the flow of water to the canopy and they cut off the stability of the tree. And they inhibit the expansion of the base of the trunk where you get that nice flare. Now this goes back to mulch because when you put mulch right up against the trunk, you're encouraging that. So I, I digress there for a second, but I wanted to be extreme in that example because it will remind you of that. And so anyway, mulch is so important. Mulch is going to protect you because when we have this heat that we're going to have all summer, mulch is going to be like a blanket. It regu you guys know this, I know, because you guys are all nodding like, yay, I'm glad to hear somebody else agrees. Mulch regulates the soil temperature. It helps with the exchange of gases. You've got gases coming out of the soil. You've got oxygen coming back in. If you have concrete, you're not getting oxygen. If you have rocks, you're not getting oxygen. Another thing that's driving me crazy is the weed protection fabrics. Everybody likes to put that down. Put weed protection fabrics in areas that you're walking or you don't have a tree or if you have like a garden and it's all little plant, little shrubs, don't use it for trees because that weed protection fabric does not allow exchange of gases. And you will find this, I have more photos than I care to, of where I'm looking at the tree and they go, oh, my tree's sick. I go, hmm, I always look down. When a tree's sick, Charles knows this, you see something sick, what's going on with the roots? I pull back the mulch. Oh, lo and behold, there is a weed protection fabric. I go, you just smothered your tree to death. Because remember, that critical root zone is really important. So that critical root zone has now been suffocating for many, many years. When I pull that fabric back, what do I find under there? All oh, these tiny fibrous roots. And they're like, help, we need oxygen. I mean, they're literally suffocating. And there's a woman, a professor up in uh, Washington, very, very um, well known, travels the circuit and teaches. And she talks about weed protection fabric. It's like taking a cloth putting it over your nose, a wet cloth, and trying to breathe through that. That's what it is like for trees. So don't use the weed protection fabric under your trees. And I also teach at UCLA in the Landscape Architecture Program, and when I teach my students, I tell them, there's lots of products out there. Doesn't mean they're good. Really be critical about thinking about it. And Charles is so good about explaining how you can be your own 
expert. You can look at the ingredients in an expert way. Like, don't just go, oh my God, it's on the shelf. I mean, I'm having battles right now with some products where I'm telling people, no, it's not a good product. And so we as consumers have to be more critical about it. And Charles brought that to light today when he brought the good and the bad. So to help you guys to understand that. Okay, so now we talked about mulch. This article by the University of California. It reads over here. Under UC for the University of California Pest Management Guidelines, and here's the website. You can find it at httpipm.ucanr.edu. And if you turn the page here, it reads, apply at least four to six inches of coarse wood chip mulch also onto soil beneath canopies, but keep mulch several inches away from the trunk. Use coarse organic mulch such as avocado trimmings, composted green waste, yard trimmings, or hardwood chips which provide better phytophthora, which means phyto means plant, tothera means destroyer. So there's a um, pathogen in the soil that'll kill all of your plants and trees um, if this if this phytophthora gets out of control. So wood mulch will help prevent this. Control then naturally drop leaves. Mulching promotes root growth into the mulch, enhances the development of beneficial microorganisms antagonistic to the P. cinnamomy, which is the phytophthora, and reduces the adverse effects of saline soil and water. How cool and great is that? Coming a little closer, you'll notice that these wood chips, as we just discussed, are going all around the tree base, but notice how much of a distance we're keeping between our walkway and the tree trunk. Check this out. If you come in a little closer, you can see under here, under our Fuerte Avocado tree, which is coated here with the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard, which we're going to discuss shortly. We can see that there's about a one less than two foot distance where there's no wood chips at all. Because if the wood chips came in a contact with the tree trunk, then the moisture from the wood chips can cause what's known as stem rot to the plant. So we're not going to put any wood chips that close to the plant. All of the benefits will be reaped by doing all of this mulching of wood chips around the tree circumference, but not necessarily that close to the tree trunk. So another one of my favorite guest speakers that I met with earlier this year is Tom Spellman of the Dave Wilson Nursery. And he talks about four benefits of mulching around your plants. That includes one, cooler soil temperatures. As we just saw, it's like a 90 degree day. You can see I'm burning up here. I can't wait to finish this, but I've got to share this knowledge with you is one, you're creating cooler temperatures by at least 10, 20, Dave's gonna um, explain that in the video. You're also saving up to 50% on water on your water bill. It increases your soil biology, and it also reduces weeding. So you're gonna get to hear that directly from Dave Wilson. Check this one out. Anybody that's in an area where it gets hot, you ride on the coast, it probably isn't gonna be a big help just for that one attribute. But that, you know, that keeping that soil cooler by 10 to 20 degrees during the hottest, most stressful time of the year is really important for good tree culture. Because at the time of year when the tree is going through the most physical stress, you're able to take a lot of that physical stress away by keeping a proper mulch layer there. So that 10 to 20 degrees is huge. If I'm in the desert, if I'm in Riverside, if I'm in El Cajon, if I'm uh, you know anywhere, anywhere that's 10 or 15 miles east of the coast, keeping that soil temperature cooler in the summer is a very important factor. So you'll get a good 10 to 20 degrees cooler soil temperature during the most stressful time of the year, allowing your trees not to go into a, a physical stress mode. When they physically stress, they defoliate, they drop flowers, they drop fruit. Now they're over the sunburn. When you get sunburn, you're in big trouble. So that relieving that physical stress is, is very, very important. And by the way, I agree with everything you said about whitewashing. I'm, I'm, I'm white, everything that goes into the ground gets whitewashed the day that it goes in. I actually uh, re whitewashed my, my apple project in Irvine yesterday. So um, it's it, it, keeping that sun stress off of tender material or even hardy material is very important to the ultimate uh, uh, longevity and success with the tree. So that mulch layer will help to do that, will help to break that, that heat uh, spike during the summer months. Number two, a two to six inch mulch layer will make better use of your irrigation water by 50%. 50%. All the studies over the years, UCR, 
UC Davis, the Cal Polys, uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. All of those studies that have been done over the years have proven that. A good layer of mulch will make better use of your irrigation water by 50%. Mm -hmm. So I can get away with irrigating any part in my landscape that's mulch only 50% as much as I would irrigate another area. That is gigantic. If it was only that reason alone in Southern California with our, with our drought situation, I know it rained a lot this year. We actually had a winter this year. But you know what? We still live in an area that gets infrequent amounts of rain and is, is in general a warmer climate. So even in our best years, it's a good idea to make better use of the irrigation water. It's, it's a commodity in the state of California that has always been stressed and it's always been on the edge and it's never gonna get any better. So if we can make better use of our irrigation water by 50%, I'm all for it. So my entire landscape, everything that's not lawn or hardscape has a, a two to six inch layer of mulch and it always will. I'm actually at a point now where I need to go in and re-mulch. So sometime in the next couple weeks, I'll be bringing in 15 or 20 cubic yards of mulch and re-mulching the entire mulch. So I do that about every 18 months to two years in general. So the third attribute of mulching would be to increase our bioactivity. It brings back beneficial. It brings back mycorrhizal activity, beneficial insects and fungi, earthworms, all those things that help trees to grow and thrive and feed in a more natural form will reoccur in the soil. It's the way things were meant to grow in nature. Walk out into any forest, walk out into any jungle, walk into the local chaparral in our foothills and look at what's underneath every single plant. There'll be a mulch layer there from years and years and years of leaf drop from those plants and other plants mm -hmm. around. Uh, my wife and I went on a, uh, a tour years ago with California Avocado Society down to Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panama Canal Zone, uh, Belize, you know, some areas in southern Mexico. And we toured um, some new avocado plantings down there and some packing houses, and we toured two different natural avocado forests. And they're, they're amazing. I mean, they're, they're giant trees. They're 100 feet tall. And the two of us couldn't touch hands around the trunks of some of those trees. And the first thing you notice when you go out into a natural avocado forest is you sink to your knees in leaf litter. So if you pull that leaf litter away and get down to the ground level, the soil level, you've got all this decomposing going on. You've got all this bioactivity. You've got the roots of the avocado trees coming up out of the soil into that mulch layer, and that's where they're taking their nutrients from. So that's the way trees and shrubs and plants were meant to grow in nature. They're always revitalizing their, their natural organic material underneath them. And what do we do? We pay the gardener to come in with a blower and blow all that stuff away, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Nothing leaves my landscape. I don't, I, I don't take anything out unless it's, it's something that is diseased or something like that, I need to get rid of it, that's fine. But, but any pruning, any lawn clippings, anything that comes off my landscape, I reincorporate into my landscape. Yeah. And, I, and I add to it on a regular basis. So. The, the key with a good mulch layer is biodiversity. We'll talk about that in, in, in just a minute. So you, want, you don't want all one product. You never want all redwoods or all grass clippings or all pine needles or all stable rate. You can have all of those things in there at five or 10 or 15% final volume, but you want the biodiversity. You want as many different types of organic product worked into that mulch layer as you can get. So the fourth attribute of a good two to four or six inch mulch layer is what's the worst chore in the landscape? Weeding. Weeding. A two to four or six inch layer of mulch will not allow weed seeds to germinate through it. You'll still get some things that'll blow in the wind and you get a little germination on top, but I pretty much guarantee you it's gonna cut your weed population down by about 80 to 90 percent. Now, never ever- So our project now later on this afternoon when it gets cooler or maybe tomorrow morning when it's again cooler, we're gonna finish mulching all around of our trees, around our tomatoes, around our squash plants, around all the other plants in the garden to get those benefits around those trees. Additionally, as Dave Wilson mentioned in this, in this last clip that you heard, talked about the importance of whitewashing. Whitewashing helps keeps your plant several degrees cooler naturally. This is a practice that's been done for hundreds if not thousands of years and Ivory Organics is an organic way to do that. Let me share this with you over here. You can get Ivory Organics in a pint sized can like this. It's also available in a gallon size like that. And you can also get in a ready to use spray bottle where you can just shake it and spray it like so. 
And these here are my pepper plants. By doing this, we're creating a foliar block that's keeping the plant several degrees cooler. If you're coming a little closer, you can see the white, um, just a light white dull that's now keeping the leaves a lot cooler with the white spray. And then it's also got these um, organic oils at a rate of about a tablespoon per gallon. So it's on the low end, which will help keep the plants also protected from any insects that may be putting some holes into the leaves as I've spotted a few over here. But the Ivory Organics is also here registered material for use in organic agriculture and it's protection against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. So I'm here now in the shade of one of my three-in-one apple trees that we created. This one here is the Granny Smith Apple. I'm hoping you can um, capture some of the apples. There's about three or four apples here. Um, I've got apples here. There's about two more up here. And then, so this here is my Granny Smith. This one here is a reddish green variety. And then I've got my red variety of apples on my right. But what I wanted to point out here is you can see that the Ivory Organics also comes in color green, the white, which is the number one seller, as well as brown, which is more of a um, aesthetically more natural looking color as well. So it comes also available in three different colors. So Ivory Organics, the concept of whitewashing here we are in the middle of summer. Dave, um, Tom Spellman of the Dave Wilson Nursery says he does it upon the installation of all of his plants. He'll whitewash his plants. But it's not just for the purpose of sun block protection in the, in the middle of summer. It's also, if you research the word whitewashing, it's typically a phenomenon that's used to preserve your trees when there's a risk of freezing nighttime low temperatures in winter. What the nighttime temperatures will do when followed by a warm afternoon followed by another freezing night is it causes the vessels within the plants to rupture. Imagine all of those pipes that are moving water up and down the tree and if they're exposed to those extreme temperatures between the freezing night temperatures and a warm afternoon, the waters are flowing and when they freeze again that following night, they rupture and that causes damage to the plant. Damage that might not even be noticeable and sometimes it is when you see the cracking upon the bark. So here's my ask to all of you. We've sold our products all around the world and I know we've got customers in pretty much every continent around the around the globe. I'm asking you to please take one minute, five minutes, or take some more time and share with us how you've used Ivory Organics in your garden. How has Ivory Organics helped save the plants in your garden? I would so love to hear those stories. Um, it's been about a year since we last asked the world to share your comments so if you are an Ivory Organic customer please write your comments down below and I really look forward to hearing um, from all of you again around the world. So within the next 30 days, just to entice you, if you have not already subscribed to the Ivory Organics ch channel, I'm gonna give you a tour of this entire garden that I've created about three, um, between three and five years ago. As most of these trees look young, um, everything happened again, like I said, within the last three to five years. Uh, but I'll give you a whole tour of my front and backyard so you can see what I've done and how I've designed it and why I designed it that way. And you can kind of see the vegetables and what's happening um, between all of these fruit trees and how I was able to accomplish maximum success in just here in my backyard, 700 square feet of land. I'm also going to take you to Brad's home. He's here in the Hollywood Hills and he's got a Moroccan style Garden of Eden. I'm going to share that with you as well. And lastly, I'm going to take you out to Pasadena where there's a tropical, um, you know, passionate grower out there that's been growing all the tropicals from all around the world. So with all of his travels, he's not necessarily looking for food, but he's got some of the most exotic flowers and the most beautiful colors with more insects than I've ever seen ever. And hopefully they're going to be there when we record again within the next 30 to 60 days. So be sure to check those out by subscribing below right now. If you've enjoyed this educational moment by Ivory Organics, be sure to like it. And most importantly, by subscribing below, you'll be connected to this and all the other educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching. Happy garden.